Now, the South Bank Show. Next, the American humorist, P.J. O'Rourke. Hello, P.J. O'Rourke is an American journalist of Irish extraction, a polemicist and humorist who doesn't so much lean to the political right, he lurches. He's a new book out next week called All the Trouble in the World. His favorite technique is to travel to some far-flung news spot to write articles and books challenging and often satirizing the more generally received wisdom of the world's press corps. He likes to annoy. He does. He's the ants in America's pants. The South Bank show has often done filmed essays. In this case, we decided to do it largely as an interview, rather than go to the expense of Globe trotting around in his wake. So rather regretfully, we tracked PJ to the heavily mortgaged, sumptuous lair he's decided to make his home in the sticks of New Hampshire, USA. Right now, at the end of the second millennium, is the best moment of all time, and right here in the United States is the best place to be at that moment. This is an era of hope in history. Why doesn't anybody say so? We are no longer in grave danger of the atomic war, which for nearly 50 years threatened to annihilate humanity and otherwise upset everyone's weekend plans. The nasty, powerful, and belligerent empire that was the Soviet Union has fallen apart. The other great malevolent regime of recent days, Red China, has decided upon conquest of the world's shower flip-flop market as its form of global domination. The bad political ideas which have menaced our century, fascism, communism, Ted Kennedy for president, are in retreat. Colonialism has disappeared, and hence the residents of nearly a quarter of the Earth's surface are being spared visits from Princess Di. The last place on the planet where white supremacy held sway has elected a president of rich, dark hue. Things are better now than things have been since man began keeping track of things. Things are better than they were only a few years ago. Things are better, in fact, than they were at 9.30 this morning, thanks to Tylenol and two Bloody Marys. <coughs> Near the beginning of your new book, you say that uh, now is the best time in all history to be alive and America's the best place to be alive in. Quite a few people might be surprised at that. Do well, for me. <laughs> <laughs> is it just for you or does it, is it a generalization you're prepared to defend at all? Uh, well, I'll defend it, but not very far. <laughs> is that, I think if you go statistically and say, you know, what is the percentage likelihood of living in a terrible, a shithole, I believe is a technical term for this. I mean, uh, I, th I think that if you were to go back a couple centuries, you'd find the statistical likelihood of being an average person on Earth in wretched circumstances would be greater than than now. So just on a philosophic calculus basis, then I take America as the country which has, uh, which is the most wonderful and fabulous country in the entire world ever, ever. <laughs> we do yeah. our own commercials. <laughs> you know what I mean. <laughs> I mean, I like America, and, and, I, and, and people in America, America does have an excellent standard of living. There are countries which are technically richer, Kuwait. And there are countries which are certainly uh, non-technically uh, uh, safer and happier. Also, America is the place where you have a... a we read about 2,000 murders in New York compared with less than 100 murders in Northern Ireland where there's been a war going on. We read about rampant crime. We read about undereducation to a crippling degree. We read about terrible poverty. We read about all this sort of thing. So why are we reading about that when you're sitting back and saying, wonderful, fabulous... Ice cream for everybody. Well, let's put it this way. If I were to rewrite that sentence to say that now is the best time to be alive on the planet Earth, in the history of planet Earth, and I think that's more or less defensible. And I say, and Canada is the best, best place to be there. You know, wouldn't people giggle just a little bit? <laughs> because there's something about America, not its actuality. Its actuality can be as bad as any place. Worse, as you say, even than Northern Ireland. Certainly worse than Southern. Uh, it, well, I don't know. I, my family was glad enough to get out. We, we were glad beam, enough. We do beam into that part. <laughs> we were glad enough to get out of there, though. <laughs> that said, um, there is something about America that represents hope and freedom and opportunity and so on. If not in reality, then at least in the abstract. And so, it's just no other way to write that sentence. I can't say. And Hong Kong is the best place until 1987, or Switzerland is the best place. If people are thinking cheese, cuckoo clocks, what? <laughs> 
America in its symbolic sense is what I'm using. It's about. interesting the way you're sort of going at it, which is being funny and also defensive, because you add on to what you've said. The sentence says, why is nobody saying that? Why is nobody... You, you feel as if you're almost a lone voice saying America is terrific at the moment, don't you? Well, it's not so much that America is terrific at the moment. I feel like I'm a lone voice saying that life's okay at the moment. You know, that things are getting... We can sit down with all sorts of UN statistics, and you know what a bunch of left-wing nut patches they are over there. So we'll take them as sort of worst-case statistics. Uh, we can, uh, can I just occasionally say objection and forget about what I say just keep talking if I raise my finger <laughs> but it's Much okay. as you I may don't want to interrupt you don't interrupt you but I just <laughs> want to put a little I just Boutros, got Boutros, golly golly indeed indeed okay all right we will we, we'll agree to disagree on that point anyway it takes all sorts of UN statistics which will show us that over the past say 30 or 40 years on average around the world there has been an increase in productivity an increase in food a decrease in hunger an increase in lifespans a decrease in infant mortality all sorts of things that show us that in materially measurable ways the world is a better place to live in than it was say right after world war ii let alone in in in, in uh, uh the year 2000 or 3004 or something um what uh, bothers me is not so much that nobody's saying America is great, and nobody's required to say America is great. What bothers me is that everybody has got themselves into the great sort of whining mode invented, I believe, by Rousseau. Life is horrible. Civilization is horrible. Everything's horrible. My feet hurt, I, 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 and I hate my parents. You know? I mean, everybody has got themselves into this great sort of bohemian complaining, perhaps we can go back a bit farther than Rousseau to say Vion. The, the, people have got themselves into this great sort of bohemian beatnik wine, this great sort of uh, hip, life is awful sort of attitude. Has be, this has become common wisdom for the many. When in fact... It's been a tyrannical trend in some ways, too. It is, and, mm. it's, and, and it's annoying, because if you actually ask people, now, are you really worse off than, say, your grandparents were? I mean, you've got the, the toilets indoors for starts, you know? And several of your own teeth. Yeah, several of your own teeth, right? You're not being shot in a great big war. <laughs> Are you really that big? much, much worse off? It has become the fashion to complain, and I think it's in a way it's it's because the luxury of modern life gives us the luxury to complain. We all know what whiners rich people are. Well, in a sense, we've all turned rich and all become big whiners. We know the truth of these matters from stories we've heard in our own homes. Existence has improved enormously within the lifetimes of our immediate family members. My grandfather O'Rourke was born in 1877 and born into a pretty awful world, even if we don't credit all of his Irish embroidery upon the horrors. The average wage was little more than a dollar a day. That's if you had a job. O'Rourke's were not known to do so. The majority of people were farmers, and do you know what time cows get up in the morning? I come from sh serious shanty Irish. My grandfather was born in 1877, one of ten kids in a one-room shack on a 40-acre dirt farm in Lyme City, Ohio. And um, I've got a picture of the, a bunch of them lined up in, in, in front of this house. Great-granddad Barney was a terrific drunk, died in a, a, a Little Sisters of the Poor, home for the bewildered and foolish. <laughs> um, although at, at a goodly age, I may say. Uh, proof if proof were needed that alcohol isn't that bad for you. Um, but he, he came up, you know, from this utter nothingness and uh, went away to the big city which was Toledo, Ohio and got involved in the automobile business in its nonage and uh, eventually became a man of, not a rich man, but you know, pretty well off. I come from a very average American background, um, a little, maybe a little on the poor side of average. My dad sold cars, died when I was real young, we were poor after that, uh, but not you know, not enough to eat. Not so much, not as much as your mother admitted it. She wouldn't admit, would she, that you're poor? No, it was very interesting. My father had died, my stepfather had died, my mother had had cancer. I knew we were having kind of a tough time. And I had some records from back then. I had the sort of file case that, that, that I'd inherited from my mom. And I found my college scholarship application that my mother had made out, her financial statement for that. And I found out that we were under the poverty level. And I had never known. And, and I was a little... Um, now, I'm not one of those people saying, uh, now, darn it, we managed to make it through. No, I, in fact, I can't imagine how she did this. I'm very puzzled. But I don't think it ever occurred to my mother that you'd ever be allowed anywhere near welfare. I don't think, I think she would have jumped on a food stamp with both feet. If she had, you know, but it just didn't occur to her to go get help. Your books are full of value judgments and very tough judgments, some of them 
caricature, some of them, I think, extremely sensible and vigorous and well-argued. Do those values come out of uh, that photograph of your grandfather and that fact of your mother looking after three kids when two husbands had died and there was very little money around? Yeah. Oh, that, that's, that's absolutely true. But I think that those are values which you'll find in the, in the great majority of America that is not covered weekly in Time or Newsweek or on the nightly news. You know, it is important to remember, like Northern Ireland, uh, the United States, of course, has its troubles, but as you know, if you, when you go to Northern yeah. Ireland, the great majority of Northern Ireland is about as exciting as a golf course. And, and the great majority of America, of course, is just ordinary middle-class people living ordinary middle-class lives, smoking crack only occasionally, <laughs> so, and, that's, and never before lunch. When it comes to taking chances, some people like to play poker or shoot dice, other people prefer to parachute jump or rhino hunting or climb ice flows, while still others engage in crime or marriage. But me, I like to get drunk and drive like a fool. Name me if you can a better feeling than the one you get when you're half a bottle of shivis in the bag with a gram of coke up your nose and a teenage lovely pulling off her tube top in the next seat while you're going 100 miles an hour down a suburban side street. You'd have to watch the entire Mexican Air Force crash land in a liquid petroleum gas storage facility to match this kind of thrill. If you ever have much more fun than that, you will die of pure sensory overload, I'm here to tell you. I'm also here to tell you that I was very young when I wrote this. Did you, did you, um, when you started to write, did you think, I have got to invent somebody who is the writer of this stuff, or did you say, this is what I think I will write it? In other words, you know, we all know the story that when Machiavelli wrote The Prince, he dressed up, literally dressed up, went into a study and wrote it. I didn't know that. Did he dress up, well, <laughs> as a man? He dressed up as a man, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the disappointment. <laughs> but the triumph is he wrote The Prince. Yes. No, I don't dress up okay, right. But a lot, of, a lot of writers actually dress up their personalities when they write, don't they? say, so I will be this sort of guy. Um, is there any sense in which you feel you're that sort of guy? That oh, certainly. I, I certainly... I, but mostly for the purposes of having a comic foil in my writing. Uh, I, I dress myself up as... Well, the idiot that I am, but a little worse so. I make myself perhaps a little bit more naive and perhaps a little bit more opinionated and a little bit drunker and a little bit uh, uh, lazier or something, you know, than, 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 than myself. But it's, it's so nice when one is writing to have a comic character who can say and do all sorts of things, and you know, because this is nonfiction, so this is important, you know that that character will never sue you, no matter how, <laughs> how, how clearly identified, even if you use his, his real name. And How so, better to avoid suing than to invent yourself? You exactly. <laughs> On the other hand, do you, be, do you basically believe all the things you say? Because sometimes people will go along with six of the things you say, and then the seventh thing, they say, ouch, this is what's come on. I mean, I can take that, but not that. I mean, I remember, when you talk about driving the Ferrari, uh, you say, I felt good about Western civilization, and the reason I felt good about Western civilization is that there I was, a living, breathing part of it, in the best damn car I'd ever driven, smack in the middle of the best damn country there's ever been on Earth. The car reaffirmed my belief in America. It may sound strange to say that a $145,000 Italian sports car reaffirmed my belief in America, but as I said, it's all part of Western civilization, and here we were in America, the apogee of that fine trend in human affairs, and after all, what have we been getting civilized for all these centuries? Why do we fight all those wars, conquer all those nations, and kill all the Indians in the Western Hemisphere? Why? For this. It's a wonderful exuberant piece. But you say, this is why we came to America, conquered civilization, killed the Indians. Now you just say, hold on now, come on. I mean, uh, that's, that's over the top. Is it, is it really necessary? What's he doing this for when I'm having a good time? I think when I was younger, I had a tendency to, um, uh, I cannot say this phrase in French, but it means, uh, it means puncturing the bourgeoisie. Can you say it in French? Epate, oui. Epate, 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 Epate yeah. le bourgeoisie. That's right. Yes, well, I used to do lots of that, even if I couldn't say it. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, now that I am the bourgeoisie and don't like getting epateed any more than the next person does, I think I tend to do less of it. But that, is, sure a, I, that is a good example. That I mean, I'm sure I could find others from your books. Which, of course, of course, I More recently than 1979. Now, what are you doing when you're doing that? Because obviously, you don't. The bits that I know about you, which aren't in the books, are as contrary to that as they could possibly be. So what are you playing at? Well, I am playing off the sort of the, 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 the great patriotic cliche, great American patriotic cliche of 
darn it, this is why we came to this country. This is why we braved those tempest-tossed seas. This is why we landed in the slums of New York and worked 29 hours a day, nine days a week. This is why we did all this, so you kids could have this wonderful Ferrari, you know. So let's take it one step further and go, this is why we worked nine, you know, this is why we worked nine days a week, 26 hours a day, and this is why we killed all the Indians. Kill, well, kill all the Indians. <laughs> Mom, Dad, you did that <laughs> for me? That's <laughs> I'm sorry to be a complete pain in the neck, but what about the Indians? <laughs> Did they think well, they're not going to be Are they any, enjoying it? Uh, they're not going to be any more alive uh, uh, for me not having yeah. made that little quip, are they? Obviously, it makes it more entertaining and more amusing, and I'm being overly earnest and a bore about this, but do you think it actually in some way invalidates what you're trying to say? No, Fine. but nothing in life is simple. Nothing short of heaven is so simple that it is unalloyed good. The marvelous, fabulous United States included. After all, what have we been getting civilized for all these centuries? Why do we fight all those wars, conquer all those nations, and kill all the Indians in the Western Hemisphere? Why for this? For this sense of mastery of man over nature. To be in control of our destinies, and there is no more profound feeling of control over one's destiny than to drive a Ferrari down a public road at 130 miles an hour. Only God can make a tree, but only man can drive by one that fast. Now, if the least of our NATO allies, Italy, can build a machine like this. Just think what we can do. Well, we may not have Ferraris, but think what our American fighter planes are like. If it feels this good in a Ferrari at 130, my God, what can it possibly feel like at Mach 2 in an F-15? Ferraris and F-15s, these are the conveyances of free men. What do the Bolshevik automatons know of destiny and its control? What have we to fear from the barbarous red hordes? So why do you run into people saying he is outrageous if what you think you're speaking for is this large slice they've obviously never of middle listened, age? Huh? They've obviously never listened to anybody else in their life after the, the, that, that other person in their life has had three drinks. You know? yeah. I mean, I'm, yes, I'm, perhaps I'm outrageous, but no more so than, than the guy down the bar in the, you know, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the cocktail lounge. We are the Republican Party reptiles. We look like Republicans and think like conservatives, but we drive a lot faster and keep vibrators and baby oil on the bedroom closet shelf. I think our agenda is clear. We are opposed to government spending, Kennedy's seatbelt laws being a pussy about atomic powers, all tiny third world countries that don't have banking secrecy laws, aerobics the UN, taxation without tax loopholes, and jewelry on men. We are in favor of guns, drugs, fast cars, free love, if our wives don't find out, a sound dollar, cleaner environment, a strong military with spiffy uniforms, Natasha Kinski, and a firm stand on the Middle East. There are thousands of people in America who feel this way, especially after three or four drinks. If all of us would unite and work together, we could give this country, well, a really bad hangover. Do you have the feeling that you are expressing views held by a lot of people who don't get a chance to express their views in public? Mm, um, I am a very average American. In this respect, I think that, uh, uh, that when I speak, there are probably a lot of people who feel the same way. But it's a statistical thing. It's not some, I'm not tapped into the American psyche in some wonderful way or unwonderful way or any way at all. It's just that I happen to be of an average age. 50% um, of Americans belong to my sex. Uh, uh, a very large percentage of Americans belong to my age group. A very large percentage of Americans belong to my education level and income. and background and so on and so by sheer dint of averageness I by probably the, have the odds are you odds are yes, yeah, yeah the, is that I mean you use the drinks thing a lot and you like a drink and I like a drink we like a drink that's fine but is that also part of the argument well I don't know if it's part of the argument it's part of the act yeah and, and what drinking really means symbolically and and when, when you use it in, in in writing in humor writing or even in nonfiction by I was drunk, they were drunk, we all had some, what we're really talking about is uh, they said what they really thought, you know, that mm -hmm. it, was, it was there with the bark on, it was there with the varnish off, uh, it, this was the, it's the, it's the way you get the id into things, you know. Ego, of course, is foremost in all writing, superego is when the writer goes, and this is the way things should be, <laughs> and the id is going, time for a cocktail, <laughs> or something worse. <laughs> In your new book, In All the Troubles of the World, you take on, you go around the world, and you take on a lot of the uh, areas of concern. which Fashionable people, worries. That's what you I call fashionable worries. Yeah. A lot of people say areas of real concern. They would, see, they would say famine is an area of real concern, and uh, destruction of the environment is an area of real concern, and so on and so forth. And you prefer, why do you prefer to call them fashionable worries? There are lots of things to worry about in life, and some are fashionable to worry about, and some are not. 
I mean, famine will kill you. There's no doubt about that. But there are many other ways to die. I will take various different kinds of oppression. I mean, why are we so worried about the government in Haiti at this particular moment in time and not at this particular moment as worried about, say, the government of um, Indonesia, in, uh, uh, in, especially as they have occupied the back half of New Guinea, yeah. where, where far worse things actually are going on. There are fashions in our concern. I agree. Why do you think it is a fashionable worry and, in a sense, a solvable problem, as you see it, uh, the question of overpopulation? Well, overpopulation is, is interesting because of how long it has been a fashionable worry. If you go back through history, you will find other little worry warts saying, oh, there are too many people, there are too many people. You can find this back to the point when there were about six million people in the world. You're going, oh, there are too many. The fact of the matter is, the cold fact of the matter is, that there are not too many people on Earth in terms of can they all have enough food, can they have enough space to live, and so on. There are probably far too many people trying to make their living off of farms the size of this rug. There are probably many too many of those. There are many too many people suffering in certain conditions. There are too many people without opportunities. But are there really too many people? Well, listen to this. If you take the current population of the world and you put them into American suburban density, lawns, parks, playgrounds, you can fit the whole population of the world into Europe with virtually all of European Russia left over uh, for uh, landfill, <laughs> or, or what, which might not be such a bad idea. Um, if you take the population of the world at the density of San Francisco, which is not one of the most crowded cities in, in the world, the city of you know low-rise apartment buildings, again, lots of parks, big streets, most people have a car, that sort of thing. If you take the population of the world at the density of San Francisco, you can fit the entire current population of the world in Texas and Oklahoma, with a couple of million left over to weed the rainforest and uh, do, you know, rake up the deserts and what, do whatever else you like. If you take the population of the world at the density of Manhattan in New York, you can fit the entire current population of the world into Yugoslavia, which, if they're going to act like Manhattanites, is about what they're, where they deserve to go. But this gives us some idea of the actual numbers of people on Earth and the size of the Earth. And this is not to say that there isn't overcrowding in places, and this is not to say that birth control is necessarily a bad idea. But are we truly talking about too many people? Are we pushing each other off the planet? Are we all going to die? Are we going to squeeze together like crowds in an elevator? Well, no. That's, that's, you know, let's back up and consider this problem. The real problem, of course, is poverty. The problem is not. Too many poor people. Nobody complains about the crowding at the Kentucky Derby. Nobody complains about the crowding on the Côte d'Azur. Uh, you know, I mean, no one, of course, people do complain about it, but I mean, no one is writing breathless books saying we're all going to die because of how crowded it is on the Riviera in August. You know? Yeah. There's an element of racism in it, isn't there, too, isn't there? Really? Isn't there just? Yeah. There's always know? too many of them. Funnily enough, nobody ever says, tiny, nasty, horribly overcrowded Belgium. <laughs> in fact, you know, Belgium and the Netherlands have very high densities of population, but we're not worried about being overrun by Dutch, are we? It always has to do with people who look a little different. So why do you think this worry has been expressed in the way it has as a terrible problem, and why do you think it has become fashionable? Well, that's, um, uh, glad you asked that. <laughs> it's going to be tough. on speed. Yeah, it's going to be tough. <laughs> do it on speed. It's tough to, uh, I do think it's a way uh, for people to express their fear of otherness and their, and their xenophobia. And it's a, a fashionable and ethically and morally polite way to be a racist and xenophobic and to, 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 to hate foreigners and foreigners and to hate other people in general, which I am much... To my mind, a lot of the people who came to claim to care about great big abstract issues tend to be uh, tend to not like people very much, as far as I can see. In the end, people are exactly alike. There's no such thing as a race, and barely such a thing as an ethnic group. If we were dogs, we'd all be the same breed. George Bush and an Australian Aborigine have fewer differences than a whippet and a greyhound. A Japanese raised in Riyadh would be an Arab. A Zulu raised in New Rochelle would be an orthodontist. I wish I could say I found this out by spending Arctic nights on ice floes with Inuit elders and by sitting with tribal medicine men over fires made of human bones in Madagascar. But actually, I found it out by sleeping around. People are all the same, though their circumstances differ terribly. Trouble doesn't come from slopes, kikes, niggers, spicks, or white capitalist pigs. It comes from the heart. The let, can we just do the same uh, with another concern in this, another, sure. another chapter, which is to do with the environment. Why do you think that 
that the worry about pollution, worry about the environment, anxieties about the rainforest and so on are misguided? Well, I don't think that they're misguided per se. I mean, these are real issues. There's no doubt about that, that there has been environmental harm and degradation that, that, that human beings have done. But part of the problem is, is that uh, uh, people approach these issues with an utter romanticism, and they refuse to uh, ask, let alone answer the question, what price do, uh, will, will we pay for an utterly pristine world? What is our principal concern? Is our principal concern that people have opportunity in life, that children have enough to eat, that human beings are free from oppression, or is our principal concern that there be lots and lots of trees? You know? And there is an element of trade-off to this. If human beings are going to be prosperous, I mean, people don't don't create pollution for the fun of it. You know, nobody's tossing stuff into the rivers uh, because they like to do that. No, nobody is deforesting the Amazon for fun. Uh, they're doing this in the interest of trying to make a living, trying to make a better life for themselves and their families and their children and their society in general. So we have to be realistic about this. You know, how, how, much of, how much environmentalism can we have without destroying life for a lot of people? And I think that the answer to that is actually is not too difficult. They, they, they can coexist. Overcrowding, hunger, dying a horrible death, these are understandable worries. Of course, we love our food, our health, and having enough room on our side of the bed. But why are we so worried about the welfare of nature? How do we get to be enamored of the outdoors? Just go out there for a minute. And no fair taking the indoors with you. Doff the little Donna Karen frock, that rumpus room for your torso. Shed those lacy Christian Dior knickers. Eschew your Joan and David pumps, small personal floors for feet. Enter nature as you, indeed, entered nature. Then get arrested. At least we mustn't forget our part of nature, too. But let's say you're on your own land and properly secluded and the kids are at camp and the cleaning lady has gone home and today isn't the day the boy comes to mow the lawn and your husband's too busy watching snooker to notice. Go outdoors and cavort. You'll learn about yourself. And what you'll learn is that you itch. Personally, I believe a rocking hammock, a good cigar, and a tall gin and tonic is the way to save the planet. From a recumbent and slightly buzzed perspective, Mother Earth is a fine specimen of womanhood, a cutie. And the environment is something for which everyone should give his all, if somebody will go get my wallet. Pour me a couple more G&Ts and I'll be making solemn eye contact and passing out hugs and saying things like, we are only guests upon this planet, so let's make our renewable resource beds and not leave a mess in the ozone kitchen. The Science Magazine devoted an entire issue to this a couple of years back, and they put a price on what, what a really good environmental program for the whole world would cost. It was considerably less than what the world is spending on arms. So it can't be done. Man damages the environment. Kids damage the carpet. Does it matter? Is it worth it? Depends on the kids, depends on the carpet. Even when the greatest degree of ecological caution is being exercised, humans wreak havoc. And so do cow farts. The environment itself plays hell with the environment. Lightning will strike a stand of old growth timber with ever so many endangered owls roosted therein. Coyotes in California have been exposed to new age philosophy and know they're supposed to be eating lower on the food chain, but they'll still gnaw the guts right out of Bambi. Urban ecologists argue that we should be nice to the earth because animals, plants, rocks, and such have as much right to be here as we do. They are our equals. This is exactly wrong. We are endowed with a moral capacity that animals, plants, rocks, and many fervent ecologists lack. We should not be dirty, wasteful, or cruel. To do so harms others. That's wrong. Therefore, we don't disembowel Bambi live the way coyotes do. We shoot him first. Got one. <laughs>
Loss of dignity. Despair. Desperate acts born from frustration. And ultimately, extinction. The cause, a cunning new widget in a can of Worthington's, making chilling it a thing of the past. Unfortunately, perfect bitter at the perfect temperature looks like making fridges a thing of the past too. So you don't need to fridge it with Worthington's widget. Perfect sound helps to make an image more powerful. The new Ferguson Nikon TV with Dolby Pro Logic. Ferguson, the bigger picture. When this woman makes soups, she only uses the finest hand-picked ingredients. Highland water, fresh vegetables, and herbs that bring out the true taste of the soup. And only when she's completely happy with a recipe will Ina Baxter put her name to it. Baxter's Soups, from the family of fine foods. The mobile phone company with more subscribers than the rest put together has stolen another march. With Vodafone Digital, the only digital service with both national coverage and the option of half-price calls to anywhere in the UK from the urban area of your choice and the chance to make and receive calls in most of Europe and beyond. Vodafone. Vodafone. Nobody goes further to keep you in touch. The 1995 Nissan Primera. Can you get this kind of enjoyment out of driving? You can, with a Nissan. The 1995 Primera. This is my family. My mum, my dad, my little sister. This is my room. This is our Macintosh. This is stuff for school. This is stuff for dinner. My dad's stuff. My mum's stuff. This is my jet. My encyclopedia. This Christmas, it's easy to please all the family. Performer, the family Macintosh. We even have our own golf course. With Podom's glass teapot, just put in the tea, the hot water, and you can tell exactly when it's tea time, from around 13 pounds. Now, liberals are people I had been accustomed to thinking of as daffy, not villainous. Getting their toes caught in their sandal straps, bumping their heads on wind chimes. How much trouble could they cause, even in a full-blown cultural diversity frenzy? But every iniquity in the world is traceable to bad thinking or bad government. And liberals have been vigorous cheerleaders for both. The principal feature of contemporary American liberalism is sanctimoniousness. By loudly denouncing all bad things, war and hunger and date rape, Liberals testify to their own terrific goodness. More importantly, they promote themselves to membership in a self-selecting elite of those who care deeply about such things. Liberals are fond of victims and seek them wherever they go. The more victimized, the better. The best victims being too ignorant and addled to challenge their benefactors. This is why animal rights is such an excellent liberal issue. Not even a democratic president is as ignorant and addled as a dead laboratory rat. The liberal is continually angry, as only a self-important man can be with his civilization, his culture, his country, and his folks back home. His is an infantile worldview. At the core of liberalism is the spoiled child, miserable as all spoiled children are, unsatisfied, demanding, ill-disciplined, despotic, and useless. Liberalism is a philosophy of sniveling brats. There, it was good to get that off my chest. Now that I've had my say, however, you might be wondering, don't I sometimes get called a Nazi? Yes. Name-calling, in which conservatives such as myself are loath to indulge, is a favorite tactic of the liberals. I have uh, often been called a Nazi, and although it's unfair, I don't let it bother me. I don't let it bother me for one simple reason. No one has ever had a fantasy about being tied to the bed and sexually ravished by someone dressed as a liberal. Do you target American liberals uh, very um, severely and accuse them of uh, forms of bureaucratic extensions, 
encroaching totalitarianism. I mean, you're really after them. So why are you using the word and why are you after them and who are they? Well, liberalism in the United States, liberals in the, the, the word with a small l in the United States has come to mean people who are in favor of virtually endless expansion of the government, and particularly endless expansion of the government into the realms of private life. And in that, and it is that, and that, and on that level only, uh, that, that I am attacking liberalism. I'm certainly not in favor of a return to Jim Crow laws or anything like that. You know. One of your basic tenets is: look, you leave it to a bunch of people, and they'll work things out. We can talk about economics, but they'll work it out. They'll, there's no traffic lights at the top of the street. Okay, they won't crash. They'll sort of filter their way through, and that'll be fine. Uh, somebody has a legitimate chance, somebody will look, you know, in a decent community, the odds are they'll be as well looked after. Uh, and now the liberals are saying, no, we can take, we will take care of all that. We will put traffic lights, we will have institutions, we will have government controls, we will have systems, we will have, and by doing that, with perhaps the best intentions of oh, the world, good the intentions, intentions, what yeah. they are doing is increasing the power of government, increasing the power of bureaucracy, increasing the control. That is your, is that your basic gripe? Yes, that's, that's sort of on the money, although traffic lights may not be a good example. Because it was uh, Frederick Hayek, uh, the uh, Austrian uh, economist and refugee from the Nazis, uh, who, fresh from the Nazis, living in, in London, wrote a book called uh, uh, The Road to Serfdom, mm. which is about the expansion of government control and what it does to the individual and, 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 the, and the dreadful consequences of it. And he was talking about communism, he was talking about fascism, and he was talking about what would become the welfare state after the war in England and, and here in the United States, too. And he, he gave us an example of the difference between um, a totalitarian government and a non-totalitarian government, or a good government and bad government, as the difference between a government that uh, built roads uh, and a government that decided where everybody should go. Mm. And that is, the, that is the crucial difference. And, uh, of course, one can't do away with all government. One wouldn't want to do away with all government. It would be a, 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 an adolescent, sort of dorm room, uh, uh, four in the morning sort of position to take. But it is important, I think, to try and get away from the endless extension of government over people. And, and basically for this reason, individuals may well be, and often are, perfect idiots and probably shouldn't be allowed to make their decisions uh, uh, for themselves. Uh, many, many individuals are really incapable of making intelligent decisions. But if that individual doesn't make the decision, who does make the decision? Anytime a decision is taken away from an individual, it is given to somebody else. And in our societies, in our democratic societies, it's generally given to a committee. And as we know, that the best of committees is worse than the least of individuals. So that's it. That's basically it. Yeah. Yeah. What is this oozing behemoth, this monster of power and expense hatched from the simple desire for civic order? How did an allegedly free people spawn a vast, rampant cuttlefish of dominion with its tentacles in every orifice of the body politic? So when can we quit passing laws and raising taxes? When can we say of our political system, stick a fork in it, it's done? When will our officers, officials, and magistrates realize their jobs are finished and return, like Cincinnatus, to the plow, or, as it were, to the law practice or the car dealership? The mystery of government is not how Washington works, but how to make it stop. Do you associate this liberal offensive, as you would say, with the politically correct offensive, which, whenever I come to the stage, which is quite frequently, does seem to be intensifying? Maybe in certain areas I'm behind and it's, it, it, it's ebbing, but I see it very much as flowing now. Do you see the con a connection there? Absolutely. The, 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 the core idea of liberalism, the thing that is offensive about it, is, is supposedly liberalism is providing the, the best life for the largest number of people. That is the aim. But in fact, the, the expansion of government means concentration of power in the political process. It means the increased politicization of life. And the politically correct stuff is exactly that. We are now taking manners. Don't say nigger. It is extremely rude. It will hurt other people's feelings. And if their feelings are sufficiently hurt, they may punch you in the face and good for them. Don't say nigger can no longer be something that our parents would tell us or our neighbors or our, you know, our, our fellows would tell us as a, as a basic sort of moral. It's now a political issue. It is going to be decided by vote what kind of language we can use. We are politicizing everything in life. When you concentrate power in the political process, you are de always transferring it to worse people because the whole idea of politics is to achieve power and prestige without merit. 
Consider politicians everywhere in the world. Would they be worth a shit doing anything else except being a politician? They have gotten out there in a sort of popularity contest in front uh, of the people, and by dint of lots of handshaking and smarmy talk, they have acquired enormous power, enormous influence, enormous prestige on the basis of no merit whatsoever. What has this damn Bill Clinton ever done? Or John Major, what has he ever done in his life except get elected? These are the 90s, the dumb decade, dumb and complaining and sad. Fan de siècle, fan de fun. I'm a victim, a victim of the tragic American IQ die-off which happened halfway through the Bush administration. I need a federal program. There are things I'm not allowed to say nowadays, the way I'm not allowed to say gimpy, fatso, mongoloid idiot, or drunken bum. I'm especially not allowed to say chick, dame, broad babe, and okay in the hooter department. I tell you, we're going to see our son sent home from school for writing the word girl on the bathroom wall. In my, at my old college, which was a rather conservative college, there's a 4,000-word section in the student handbook about how boys and girls shall treat each other. You know? and, and, and for snapping a girl's bra strap in the cafeteria line, I mean, you can truly go to hell. <laughs> I mean, you can really, you can go to jail, certainly be thrown out of the school. And this is, again, taking what should be... But why, is he go, why has he gone crackers like that in this country, which is so vigorous, individual, Sodom, a mixed... Uh, I so come that, back. Not Sodom. Yes, uh, yes. And, that, and yes. So, so what, what's going on? I come back on? to the acquisition of power, prestige, and influence without merit. I'll give you this example. Say there's a group of feminists. Well, let's not even pick on feminists. Let's, let's, let's say that there's a, a group of students at school who are very, very concerned that meat eating is wrong. Now, they can, by dint of organizing and campaigning, they can influence the, the, the school rules. Maybe they can't stop meat eating at school, but they can, have, they can get large posters of dying calves posted around the, the dining halls, and they can get warnings about the dangers of meat put on, uh, on, in, on each meat item. And they can influence the behavior of all the other students simply by yelling and screaming loudly and by organizing. Meat. Despite the fact that meat is made from dead animals, it shouldn't smell that way. Try this test for meat freshness. Close your eyes and see if you can tell the pork chops from a gym locker. Almost all varieties of meat are good enough to be better than vegetables, except veal. Veal is a very young beef, and like a very young girlfriend, it's cute but boring and expensive. Veal will eventually grow into something worthwhile, such as a steak, but it won't do this in your refrigerator. This is the beauty of PC political correctness. If you have something you really care about, meat eating, for instance, you just have to make a lot of noise. You can achieve your ends without merit if you use the magic of politics. And this is one of the reasons I hate the expansion of the political system so much. The Cassandra element in your work is saying, look, we are a society of individuals. Uh, why are we being encroached upon by a society which is trying to take us all over and prevent us from things like, well, the basic things, such as the consequences of our own actions? Why are we deprived of our individual purpose and strength in that? Yes, that's it. Couldn't put it better myself. You know, I mean, when you deprive people of the consequences of their action, when you make a world harmless, you do not, you're not doing anyone a favor. I think that we are tending in this, in, in the modern world, to create a life without consequences, and then For we instance, turn around. You're saying, well, when people commit a crime, well, they're not, uh, they're not bad. They're sick. They need, they don't need jail. They need, let alone the gallows. They need therapy. They need kindness. They need understanding. Uh, when people throw all their money away, this is, oh, that's all right. There's a government pension that will take care of you. You don't have to save, and you don't have to defend, depend upon your family. When children refuse to learn anything in school, well, they must have a learning disability. They're not just, you know, staring out the window and wishing that they were out playing ball instead of learning their multiplication tables. When you deprive uh, a life of consequences, you deprive individuals of dignity. And I think what we're doing is we're creating, we're tending to create a world where actions have no consequences. And then we get deeply shocked when people start to act like nothing matters. Mm. But again, it baffles me about your country that a lot about political correctness you can go along with. Why should young women be harassed unnecessarily, as they, they often have been in the past? So you can go along with that. Um, and so it goes on in various, in, in various other areas. But why is it reaching such a, 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 almost an epidemic proportions? 
Maybe America's more Shortism. fertile ground for this is having having fewer uh, 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 and, and shorter traditions than than, mm. than other uh, industrialized democratic societies. Maybe it's a little easier to be silly in America. I mean, we certainly have uh, uh, previous uh, 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 you know uh, religious manias, uh, the Ku Klux Klan, all sorts of fads and stuff. Uh, things that would be hard to imagine in uh, in, in say France uh, or or Britain will sweep this nation. Interestingly enough, though, they rarely go as far as the kind of things that say sweep Russia or Germany. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Don't get that. To but me. again, to get it in a bit of proportion, talking about city beliefs, you yourself in common with a great number of the, the generation you represent had an enormous number of city beliefs in the 60s, didn't you? Precisely. And I think one of the things, you know... I mean, you might you enumerate a few for those who might not remember what silly things we did well, in, the, in the 60s. In the 1960s, I mean, I, I think really, I, I believed mean, everything. I believed everything, you know. What I believed in the 60s. Everything. You name it, I believed it. I believed love was all you need. I believed you should be here now. I believed that drugs could make everyone a better person. I believed I could hitchhike to California with 35 cents and everyone would be glad to feed me. I believed Mao was cute. I believed private property was wrong. I believed my parents were Nazi space monsters. I believed stones had souls. I believed the Viet Cong were good guys in Vietnam. I believed Yoko Ono was an artist. I believed Bob Dylan was a musician. I believed I would live forever or until 21, whichever came first. I believed the world was about to end. I believed the age of Aquarius was about to begin. I believe the I Ching said to cut classes and take over the dean's office. I believe that wearing my hair long would end poverty and injustice. I believe there was a great throbbing web of psychic mucus and we were all part of it somehow. There was very little, with the exception of anything that my parents told me. <laughs> I believed everything else. Well, you're a bit of a liberal, really, Peter. You? <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, and then some. Yeah, I certainly was. I no, was a uh, 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 wanker, I think, is a technical <laughs> term. <laughs> it's fashionable to say that I have not changed, my views are the same, the world has changed. You oh, insist baloney. That you, you <laughs> no, insist no, all of my changed. views have you changed. changed. <laughs> all of my views have changed. The world has remained exactly the same. <laughs> oh, no. So what do you believe now? Have you got a, have you got a matching list? No. <laughs> no, I don't. You believe uh, you shouldn't have a matching I list. Have a few, <laughs> I have a few very basic beliefs. Uh, never uh, pull a uh, sweater on over your head with a lit cigarette in your mouth. You know, <laughs> things like that You know, that I try to guide my life with. You know? But, uh, no, I, I, I would say I'm pretty skeptical. What I believe now, nothing, or nothing much. Maybe we should start by remembering that we already live in a highly idealistic, totally revolutionary society. And that our revolution is based on reality, not bunk. Furthermore, it works. Look at America, Western Europe, and Japan. It works like all hell. We have to remember it was the American Revolution that set the world on fire. And maybe we should start acting like we believe in that American Revolution. The president and his advisors will not have to sit up late working on a speech to fire the public in this cause. There is a perfectly suitable text already in print. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure those rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their powers from the consent of the governed. And that is a much wilder idea than anything which occurred to me during the 1960s. Several times in your, in your more recent essays, you've gone back to the simple seeming sentences of the founding fathers and said, that's what America is about. Why don't we stick to thinking like this and above all writing like this and declaring that we'll behave according to these terms? Why do you, do you find them still so, not attractive, they're obviously attractive, but so relevant and could be applicable? It was uh, uh, just an amazing piece of work. The American Constitution and uh, sort of Bill of Rights, those basic documents that were turned out are masterpieces of enlightenment thinking. They came up with a great set of basic rules for a society. The tradition is all your society is based on. You don't have a written constitution. But what our guys did was basically take your tradition and put it in the briefest, clearest way almost possible. And it still parses. It still reads 200 years later. It reads with perfect clarity. This business it has always intrigued everybody in the American uh, Constitution, the pursuit of happiness. Yes. Yeah, well, it is. It's, an, it's a poetic, it's a wonderful... It just sort of comes out of nowhere, doesn't it? Why, why, is, why is this on the map all of a sudden? Who's, <laughs> who can legislate for or believe it? But how does that relate, do you think, to money? Because, of course, nowadays, a lot of people would say happiness is money. Yes, and they're right, and in, 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 in not in a way that they think they are. Money is extremely important. To individuals have money is extremely important because money it, it represents no particular thing, but it represents the potential to get the thing that you think is most important. We're not talking about huge wealth here necessarily. We're just talking about decent wherewithal. When a person has money, he can then 
that money may go to the church, it may go to the charities, it may go to educate his children, it may go to establish a comfortable home for him and his family, it may go to support other members of his family, it may go for his health care, for the health care of the people in his family, and so on and so forth. And we don't know where that money is going to go. Now we can say of all those things, well, the, the state can support your church, the state can give you health care, the state can make sure you have a good diet, uh, the state can educate your children, uh, the state can uh, uh, really, uh, you should leave these charities to, to, to the state, they're better organized, uh, they'll do this. But see, that is telling people where to go rather than building the highway. And the beauty of money, the importance of money, all, you might even say the spiritual side of money is the fact that it frees people from the, from the tyranny of others. If you have a bit of money of your own, you do not have to take any shit. Let's, 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 let's just be blunt about this. You know, We all know that. Now, will that make you a good or a happy person? Mm, no, no. That you have to do on your own. Will it allow you to become a good and a happy person if you're capable of doing that? Yes. Is that why you said at one stage that money is better than politics? Well, money is definitely. Most things are better than politics. Money is certainly better than politics. I mean, ask yourself, would you rather have money or would you rather have politics? Simple as that, you know? But there are those who would say, look, um, in pursuit of money, in pursuit of more profits, it, whether it's the East India Company or the great corporations of Europe and America, in pursuit of wealth, uh, all sorts of devastations, oppressions, suppressions, uh, subjugations have occurred. Uh, and that if it had been spread in a more even way, it would have been a better world. Yes, all sorts of horrible things have been done for the sake of money, as they've been done for the sake of power and the sake of love and so on and so forth, and they're absolutely indefensible. But would it be fixed if we spread everything around, if we spread the money around evenly? Well, you can't spread the money around evenly, as the, as the Chinese and the Russians and the Albanians and all the rest of the, that lot have, have, have proved to us so well, because power takes the place of money. If everybody has the same amount of money, then power starts to divide up. But more importantly, at the root of that idea, at the root of the great leveling idea, mm -hmm. the great leveling economic idea that, that has been with us now since you know, the early 19th century. Before is that, the, actually, the levelers themselves. Yes, yes, yeah. indeed. Mm -hmm. Is the idea that wealth is finite, which when we all grew things for a living, it probably was. When land was the currency, it probably was. The idea that if I have too many slices of pizza, you're going to be left with nothing but the Domino's box, the gnaw on at home. You know? And in the modern world, Wealth simply is no longer finite. Creative human beings are able to generate more wealth. Now, certain things will remain finite. Beachfront property will be finite, you know, and, and you know, a, a wonderful uh, little house right on the strand or something is going to be, there are going to be a finite number of those. But wealth in general, the, the, the ability to enjoy um, a lot of food and a nice car and some swell clothes and stuff, we are able to generate plenty of that for, to, to go around. How to get it to go around? Ah, uh, no, that's a very interesting. Uh, that's a very interesting problem. Rich is, of course, what we must be if we're going to fix the world. Money unsaddles the four horsemen of the apocalypse, or anyway, mounts them on donkeys. Famine, plague, destruction, and death become heart disease, cancer, car wrecks, and accidents in the home. Money is preferable to politics. To rid ourselves of all the trouble in the world, we need to make money, and to make money, we need to be free. But oh, the trouble caused by freedom and money. Is it possible what the great philosophers have told us through the ages is true, that money isn't everything? Sure, that's what they would tell us, because how much does being a great philosopher pay? And yet, even vast amounts of cash and small unmarked bills cannot release us from the human condition. All the trouble in the world is human trouble. We can fix it all, and we'll still be humans causing trouble. Maybe this isn't such a hopeful moment in history. Really, it's something of a disappointment to know that when mankind does achieve such things as property rights, rule of law, responsible government, and universal education, the fruit born of these splendid accomplishments is, mm, me. Is it perhaps that we are victims of our success, that things have gone too well for people in the United States? And one of the great problems with wealth is that when you get everything you want, you still turn out to be the same person in the morning. You wake up in the morning and there you are in the mirror, just as you were before. And so America looks at itself in the mirror and says, we still have the same hangover. Yes, we still have, the, yes, yes, we drink too much and we still get a headache. You know, how can that be? We, this, was, this was the highest it was, it was good, it was good whiskey last yes, night. Yes, it was good whiskey last night. I shouldn't have a hangover this morning. <laughs> and for the future, but I write this reeling, having got drunk exceedingly today, so that I seem to stand upon the ceiling, I say the future is a serious matter, 
and so, for God's sake, hock and soda water. week there's a London program special Rachel Nickell the untold story next Sunday at half past ten